Good morning, God bless the faithful. This is Sister Liberty and I'm back with another teaching. So I have been meditating on a couple of things, but what I guess stood out to me this morning as the Bible was playing in my household was patience in waiting on the Lord. Sometimes that can be easily said then done you know to wait on the lord because many times we find ourselves having all of these plan b's and c's and all the way down to z and we we understand that if god doesn't come through then i have something else to fall back on but you know that's not real faith and that's not having patience what are we defining patience as because you know, I used to think that being patient was, you know, just waiting, waiting, you know, to be seen, waiting to enter in, waiting to receive something, just, you know, just waiting. The fact that I had to wait at all means that I was patient or that I had patience. But over the recent years, and even now, I'm still understanding what patience is. Patience isn't just you simply waiting. Patience is you waiting learning to wait with the right attitude your disposition your body language because i could i could be waiting but my feet is tapping or i can be waiting and i have my arms crossed and so waiting on god waiting for the things of god it looks like waiting with the right heart the right disposition the right attitude and actually enjoying things as they come while you are waiting on God. One of the reasons why we choose to not wait on God is very basic, very simple. It's because of fear. It's because of fear. We are afraid of the unknown. Anytime control is outside of our hands, anytime you know we can't predict the the future or we can't predict the outcome, then we are afraid. We are afraid because we as people we like to be in control it's it's in us it's in you it's a part of your sinful nature to fight or flight as they call it so if you feel as though you're ever put in a predicament where your life is threatened or you know you feel as though there's going to be a loss then your body will automatic go into this this state of survival where you know, you'll do anything to protect yourself or you'll do anything to survive or, you know, in that moment of your life being threatened or, you know, being your, someone's coming against your life. In that moment, you will do what's in you to do to survive, to save yourself. So maybe you'll run. If you're being chased by an animal, your instinct is to run. You're going to fight or flight. Either this situation, this circumstance is going to cause you to fight back, retaliate, or you're going to try to escape. You're going to try to find a way out. You're going to run from it. And so when it comes to the things of God, those are just things that are outside of our control. Although man thinks that they're in control of God and the things of God, men feel as though, you know, well, if God doesn't do it, then there's another way to get it done. There's another way to get it done. And this is why the fall of man is, is so bad and that the heart of man is evil continuously that's what, that's what the word of god says that the heart of man is evil continuously and that your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked because in your sinful state nothing good dwells there the word of god says that in your flesh dwells no good thing and so when we choose to not wait on god it's because we're afraid that god won't come through we're afraid because we're we're prone and we're used to failure. We're used to living in a broken, messed up world, a world that's unreliable, a world that's not dependable. I'm used to failure. I'm used to things just not working out. You know, sometimes things just don't work out in your favor. I'm used to people giving up. I'm used to people walking away. I'm used to things not working and so when it comes to God and God making promises to me that's kind of hard because of the world that I live in and so it takes faith 
to believe God, period. You have to believe God. It takes faith to believe that God is who he says that he is, that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That takes faith. Jesus told his disciples, only believe, only believe. I know that you come from a world of having plan B's and C's. I know you come from a world where you're used to making the predictions. You're used to telling what the outcome is going to be. But I'm telling you to only believe. I'm telling you to not lean on your, your own understanding, but to lean on me, lean on the rock. That takes great faith. So many times we don't trust God and we don't wait on God because of fear and because of our experiences, our experiences tell us that I have to look out for myself. Our experience tell us that, man, I've gone through pain. I've gone through suffering. I've gone through missing out. And so we, we try to have so much control over our lives because of fear. And we try to make sure that we don't lack anything. We don't miss anything. We're not going without. We're not suffering. We're not experiencing any pain and so it can be really really hard to trust God but to also wait on God what does it mean to wait on God it means that I first of all it means that I am letting God be God that's the first thing that's the first thing we're letting God be God that means I'm going to follow after his order. I'm going to follow after his timing because again, God's timing is not our timing. So when I when I say that I'm going to let God be God, that means that I'm going to take the back seat. That means that I'm going to learn to be still. That means that I'm not going to be governed by fear because if I'm governed if I'm governed by fear, if I feel a sense of fear, if I'm afraid, if I am timid, then I'm going to do what I think is necessary in the heat of the moment to make whatever decision that I see is fit. I'm going to make an impulsive decision. I'm going to make a decision based off of fear. And so what that means is I'm not clearly thinking of the consequences that this decision over here can make because I'm governed by fear because I, I'm afraid that God may not come through. I'm afraid that maybe God is taking too long. What if, what if, you need answer prayer now. What if you're praying for a loved one? Or what if you are needing God to provide you things financially? What if you are wanting God to answer right now? But what if God is choosing to wait a little longer to answer you? You have a decision to make. Either you can be governed by fear in your falling world, your falling nature, making impulsive decisions. And in the making of those impulsive decisions, you're not thinking clearly because you only see what's in front of you. You don't see what's ahead. You don't see that this decision right here is going to affect you later on in the future. You don't see that because, you know, your emotions blind. Fear blinds. Fear will allow you to make all kinds of decisions that will harm you in the end. And so when we make the decision to wait on God and to trust God, we understand that God has everything in his control. God is in control. You know, sometimes we say that God is in control, but we don't really understand what that means when we say God is in control. When we say that God is in control, we're saying that, Lord, your will, not my will. Lord, do whatever you see fit. And in that, I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to wait on you. I'm not going to move before you. Many times we can find ourselves moving before God and finding ourselves in trouble. And as I thought about the moving before God, meaning you're supposed to be waiting on God, but let's say you got impatient. Let's say you got tired of waiting. Let's say that you felt as though maybe, maybe God forgot, or maybe God just decided he wasn't going to do it. And so you decided to move before God. And as you did, you realized that God was going to move, but you just had to wait on him to move, but you got impatience. And now you are left to deal with this situation. I thought about King Saul. I thought about King Saul when the prophet Samuel told him, hey, wait here. I'm going to be here in seven days to offer up the sacrifice and wait here. And by the seven day or the eight day, King Saul, instead of him seeking the Lord for counsel, asking the Lord for guidance and understanding and help, Saul took it upon himself. Because again, Samuel told him he was going to come on the seventh day and he did not come at all. And so he began to take matters into his own hand. Maybe he began to feel 
a sense of fear. Maybe he became afraid of, man, what's going to happen now? I just became king. I'm responsible for these people. Samuel's not here. What am I to do? I have a decision to make. Maybe he was pressured by the people. Maybe he felt obligated to take matters on, on himself. But we see that and his disobedience because when we choose to not wait on God, when we choose to be impatient, when we choose to move before God, that is disobedience. Anything that is separate from the instructions God gave you is disobedience. Anything that God has told you to do, because again, God sets the standard. God sets the order. God gives the instructions. And so Anything that I do that's outside of those instructions, even if I thought God meant something else, even if I thought that God had maybe forgotten about this, this, this prayer or this promise, and I make a separate decision, that is disobedience. We know that in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, how God gave them clear instructions to not eat of this tree. He says, in the garden, you will, you can eat of every tree that you want, that you like. But then the serpent, the serpent came in and beguiled Eve. He got Eve to believe that God was withholding from her and withholding from Adam. He got Eve to believe that she can be in control too. She can be in control too. God is not the only one in control. You can be in control too. Things were perfectly fine when they let God be in control and they submitted up under that. The moment she disobeyed the instructions of God, that's when that fear came in. We know that fear was one of the first things to come in because they went and they hid themselves. And so we see how when we are governed by fear, when we disobey the Lord's instructions, there are consequences associated and attached to our decisions. And so I wanted to look here in 1 Samuel 13 concerning King Saul and, you know, just his unwillingness to wait on God. He had areas of pride and rebellion and stubbornness and unbelief in his heart because he had a history of disobeying. This this isn't the only time where we read about King Saul disobeying the Lord. We saw that later on he disobeyed the Lord when the Lord told him to go into the land of the Amalekites and slay everything. But we know he chose to not do that. He spared the king and he spared the best sheep and the best ox. And even in that, when you read about it, you can see you can see how King Saul felt as though he had did the right thing. Like he obeyed the Lord. Like it almost seemed like he was happy about the fact that he spared the king and that he spared the best ox and the best sheep. But he had disobeyed the Lord. And that cost him the kingdom. That cost him the kingdom. So you don't get to decide what you lose when we disobey God. You and I, we don't get to decide. And that's the, the scary part about it. We don't get to try to gamble with God and try to see, well, well, how much of a loss will it be? How much will I lose? You don't get to decide. That's why it's important and that it's vital that we obey. The prophet Samuel says obedience is better than sacrifice. It's better to obey than to sacrifice anything else. And so here we are in 1 Samuel 13. I guess I'm trying to figure out where I want to start. Mm. I'll start in verse 8. So this is 1 Samuel 13, or 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 8. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So... He's referencing back in 1 Samuel 10 where the Lord gave or where Samuel gave Saul the instructions. If you go back to 1 Samuel 10 real quick, verse 8, it does say, And you shall go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto you and offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace, peace offerings. Seven days shall you tarry till I come to you and show you 
what you shall do. So he's giving, he's giving Saul instructions to Terry here. Seven days and I'm going to come and I'm going to offer up the sacrifice and I'm going to tell you what to do. So he says that back in 1 Samuel 10 verse 8. I probably should have went there first, but it's okay. So we see that Saul was given the instructions to wait there. That word Terry means to wait. And Samuel told him, I'll be there in seven days. And so it's interesting how it's first Samuel 10 or yeah, first Samuel chapter 10, verse eight. And now him not waiting on the prophet Samuel is first Samuel chapter 13, verse eight. That's that's very interesting. That's very interesting. So it says he tarried there seven days. So he waited. You know, he did wait. Sometimes we could feel as though, well, I did wait because we actually, you know, we we. We waited. We waited. We stayed there. You know, I wait. I waited on God long enough. Sometimes we can feel as though we waited on God long enough. And so it says he tarried seven days according to the set time Samuel had appointed. So this is the set time Samuel gave me. He told me he'll be here at this appointed time. It's that time now. He's not here. He's not here. But Samuel came not to Gilgal. And the people were scattered from him. So it's the set time. It's the appointed time that the prophet Samuel gave, gave King Saul. And Samuel is not even here. Many times the Lord will allow things like that to happen to test what's in our heart and to show us what's in our heart. The Lord is so perfect that he, set, he sets things up like that so that you can prove what's really in your heart. Just He does things just like that. I know I said I would do this in this time, but I'm choosing not to. And it's not that God isn't keeping his end of the bargain. It's not that God isn't holding down, you know, his end of the covenant. He is. You know, the children of Israel, they were supposed to go into the promised land after two years. But many of them did not go into the promised land. Their children, those that were under 20 years old, their children went into the promised land after 40 years. After 40 years. So it's not that God, you know, excuse me. It's not that God goes back on his promises. It's just the fact that God chooses to do something else simply so that we can see what is in our heart. No, I was going to do this. I was going to still do this. I was going to do this at this time. But I wanted you to see what was in your heart. That if I did not do it at the appointed time, would you still be faithful? Would you still wait on me? Would you still trust in me? We're going to go somewhere else after this, but let me finish. And it says, and Saul said, bring here a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering and it came to pass, meaning it happened. Eventually it happened that as soon as he had made an end of the offering, <laughs> the burnt offering, I've been in a scenario similar to where I felt as though God was not going to come through. I felt as though I wanted to take back control because of fear, because of the unknown, because of time. You know, it's taking too long. And as soon as I made another decision, as soon as I took on another option, God came through. God did it. I don't know if you've ever felt that feeling, but you feel so low. You feel so unworthy. <laughs> like God was going to do this the whole time. Yes, he said that he was, but you being governed by fear and your own emotions and the pressures of your world, you decided to make another decision. And when you did, God showed up and did the thing anyways. So God was going to do it already, but fear told you that God wasn't, you know? So I've been in those situations to where I made other decisions just for God to show up and do that thing anyways. You feel so low. So it was right at that moment after Saul offered up the sacrifice that Samuel decided to show up. It just so happens that at the perfect time, he decides to show up and he sees Saul offering this burnt offering. It says, behold, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, because I saw the people were scattered from me and that you came not within the days appointed. Like you told me you were going to be here in, in this amount of time, this amount of days and you, you didn't come. And I noticed that the people were beginning to, you know, get out of place. You know, they begin to scatter, to move. And he says, you didn't come at the time that you said. And the Philistines gathered themselves together at Mishma. Therefore said I, instead of consulting with the Lord, like King David did, 
he says, the Philistines, he said to himself, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. Yeah, you're going to make all kinds of force, forceful decisions when you're out of the will of God. Yeah, you're going to be left to do that because when we disobey God, we breach our relationship with God. Whenever we disobey God, we breach the relationship. And so, yeah, you're going to feel as though you're left to yourself. You're going to feel as though you're on your own. And now you're forced to have to make these kinds of decisions because, number one, you're governed by fear. And number two, you're impatient. So you're going you're going to feel put in a place and in a position to have to make the decision on your own. Yeah, he says, I forced myself, therefore, to offer in to offer a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. He says, thou has not kept the commandment of the Lord God, which he commanded you. For now would the Lord have established your kingdom upon Israel forever. But now the kingdom should not continue. Or he says, but now your kingdom should not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. My goodness. And the Lord has commanded him to be captain over his people because you have not kept that which the Lord commanded you. Again, God doesn't waste his words. When God speaks, that's instructions. That's instructions. Anything opposite of that is disobedience. Again, when we disobey, we don't get to determine what's at risk. I don't get to determine what I lose. And what's on the line. That's why it's very important. It's vital. It's vital that we obey. Even in the smaller areas that we obey. Because Saul's disobedience. The fact that to us it may seem very simple. Like man. All the man did was, was sacrifice. Because he thought that God wasn't coming. Many of us would have thought the same thing. If we can just be honest. Being in Saul's situation. Many of us would have thought. Well I guess he's not coming. I mean how many times. Have we been put in similar situations where we felt as though, well, I guess it's not going to happen. I guess it's not just, I guess it's just not going to happen. I guess God is not going to do it anymore. I guess, you know, they don't want to do this right now. I guess it's not going to happen. And we've taken matters into our own hands just to later find out that the thing was going to happen anyway, or the individual was going to do it anyway. We just had to wait. This is what happens when we have other things in the way such as fear, such as unbelief, such as rebellion and, you know, impatience. I'm so impatient. I'm, I'm very impatient. I want this done now. I want God to do this now. It cost King Saul the kingdom. He didn't know it was going to cost him the kingdom. That's the thing. You, you don't get to decide what it's going to cost you. That's why you must obey he felt as though he said, I forced myself because of the people and because of the opposition in front of me, you know, the enemies in front of me, I feared them. I feared that God was not going to come through. I feared that, you know, that lack of trust. I feared as though God was not going to rescue. God was not going to step in and intervene. I feared. That's why we have to not be governed by fear and we got to live by faith. Because faith tells me that I am not alone. Faith tells me that if I do lack assurance and confidence, faith tells me that I can go and consult with the Lord or that I can go to his word. I don't have to be left to myself or feel as though I'm left to myself. And now I have to make other decisions where I'm not aware this is going to cost me something. Anytime we disobey God, we need to respect the fact that there's going to be a loss. Anytime I disobey God. Anytime I disobey the Lord's instructions, I disobey his voice, there's going to be a loss. And we don't get to determine what is lost. I don't get to determine what God decides to take from me. So Saul didn't know that that day the kingdom was going to be rented from him and given to another. Samuel said, God has taken the kingdom from you and given it to someone else that's after his heart. So apparently Saul didn't have a heart that was after God's heart because if he did, then he would have consulted in the Lord. He would have sought the Lord's heart for instructions. Hey, God, the prophet Samuel is not here. He told me seven days. I need to know what to do. Do I be still or do I move? The Lord would have told him. 
But this is what happens when we try to do things on our own and we take matters into our own hands because we're afraid. I'm afraid of the outcome. I'm afraid of the unknown. I'm impatient right now. I want God to do this right now. I want Samuel to be here right now. Samuel didn't show up at the time that he told him. Sometimes God makes us promises. God shows us things. And when God doesn't do it in our timing, when God doesn't do it right now, today, next week, I pray today. So I'm expecting an outcome next week or I'm, I'm expecting a response tomorrow. When God doesn't do that thing, then we feel as though, well, maybe God is not going to do it at all. That's, that's what our soul tells us. That's what our world tells us. That's what the enemy tells us. Maybe God is not going to do it at all because your soul already believes that God doesn't love you. Your soul already believes that. Your soul already hates God. That's what we're fighting up against. Your soul doesn't want to submit. Your soul doesn't want to live by faith. Your soul doesn't want to wait on God. You are, there's a part of you and I that believes God is not good to us. A part of your soul believes that God doesn't really love you and that he does not want to give you good things. And we're fighting against that. This is why we have to fight impatience. We have to fight doubt. We have to fight unbelief because if we don't, then we'll find ourselves in situations like King Saul, where there's a loss of something. No, because you disobeyed, you know, I have to take something from you because you were supposed to. So your obedience pleases God. When I obey, that pleases God. That pleases God. It's almost as if when I obey, I'm giving God my trust. So in my obedience, I'm giving God something. I'm giving God my heart. I'm giving God my trust. I'm letting God know that you are trustworthy. You are dependable. I'm giving God something of me. I'm giving God me. I'm giving God me. I'm letting down walls of fear. I'm letting down the barriers of impatience. I'm giving God me. And so whenever I disobey, something else has to be taken. That's why there's a loss. There's a loss. And so I also thought about Acts chapter 2 of how there were many, many people waiting on the promises of God in Acts 2. Many people. But when the Spirit of God decided to manifest, there was only left 120, if I'm not mistaken. So what happened there is it didn't start off with 120. It started off with more. It started off with more, but those that left, they became impatient. They became impatient. They decided to no longer wait. They decided that waiting was no longer worth it. They decided that they had other things to do, better things to do. You know, I could be doing other things right now instead of waiting. I don't know when this, this promise is going to manifest. I know that he said it, but it's taking too long. Sometimes we choose to not wait on God because... Things are taking too long. We choose to make other decisions because we really just don't like the process of waiting. If we can just be honest, we do not like the process of waiting, especially in the time that we're living in. We live in such a moving, fast paced generation. They call it the microwave generation where everything is in and out. In and out, the drive through in and out, grocery shopping, in and out. Just drop it off at my door. Package delivery, in and out. I need it tomorrow. Can you can you expedite it? Can you prime it? Like in, in and out, in and out. We live in a time that's so far from God, meaning things in heaven are still the same as they were in times before. Ancient, ancient, you know, they're not... You know, modernizing things in heaven, like things are still the way that they were in times past. And so because we're so far outside of time, we're so far away from the way things were that we engage God with our impatient mindsets. We engage God with our microwave mindsets, our microwave mentality. We approach God as one who's in a bottle. Like he's a genie. We approach God in that manner. And we feel as though that God needs to answer immediately. God needs to answer now. I need a response now. I need an answer now, God. I need you to do something now. I need you to intervene now. And so having to undergo a process of patience is 
not what many of us enjoy doing. Many of us, we, we don't know what it's like to wait because we live in a time where we're being taught you don't have to wait. If you want it, you can go after it now. You can have this now. You don't have to wait weeks out, months out. You can have this now. And so when we get a no from God or if we get, a, uh, you know, you must wait and be still from God. We don't want to be still. Saul was not still. He was not still at all. He was not still. He did not wait. If we choose to wait on God and we undergo the process of patience, then God can actually bless us. We can actually see the hand of God moving a lot more in our lives and we can, we can experience the blessings in the favor of God a lot more. Like there's so much more that God wants to do for us and through us. We just choose to not wait on him because again, God's timing is not our timing. What if God takes too long according to my standard of time? What if I believe that this should have been done within this amount of time and God decides that he wants to do it nine months out. You know, the woman with the issue of blood, she had been battling that for a very long time, a very long time. And it was in a moment that she was healed of that infirmity when she touched the hem of his garment, Jesus' garments. She had been dealing with this. She could have lost all hope. She could have given up, but she did not give up. She did not give up. That's why she got the healing that she wanted she wanted and so the people in acts chapter 2 the 120 they decided to wait on god no matter how long it took because something in them told them that if god said it if jesus said it then he's going to fulfill it it doesn't matter what other obligations that are outside of this house it doesn't matter what kinds of things people are doing let those who feel as though they have other things to do better things to do let them go and miss out then they just have to be one of the ones that hear about what happened yeah man the moment you left god showed up god manifested as a pillar of fire on our heads yeah the moment you left Everybody just began to speak in diverse tongues. Man, it was miraculous. Man, we all received great impartation. How would you feel knowing that you were the last one to go in the moment you stepped out of the door and you went to go do whatever else because you felt as though God was taking too long? It's never going to happen. The moment you stepped out, the Spirit of God fell. He fell on them as cloven tongues. He fell on them and now you just got to hear about it like, oh man. Yeah, the moment... Saul offered up the sacrifice. Samuel showed up. Like, man, you show up now? Come on. I like I, I waited seven days for you. <laughs> and not only that, I, I waited for the appointed time. Yeah, you 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 don't you don't know how God works. It's right at that moment where we choose to disobey that God wants to show up. Like, Lord, you do this now. So you're gonna do it all alone. I was gonna do it all alone. You just needed to trust me and to wait on me. Yeah, Acts 2, he manifested, he he fell on the individuals that were available when we wait on god we tell god that god i'm available when we do things god's way we tell god god i'm available god i trust i trust you you're trustworthy you're dependable i don't have to be governed by my situation and my circumstance many times we choose to step outside of the will of god and make impulsive decisions because we see our situation i know this situation is, is real. This is not something in my mind like this situation is in front of me. It's almost tangible. I can see it. And so many times we allow ourselves to be governed by our situations and it causes us to move before God. It causes us to have a plan B and a plan C. It causes us to disobey God because now that I'm outside of the will of God because I'm not waiting on God, now I have to make another, another decision. Now I'm going to find myself you know, out of the will of God, because now I am left to make another decision. God had already planned it all out. All I had to do was just be still and wait. God had already figured it out. He figured out my situation. He's going to come through. But when I feel as though God is taking too long, when I feel as though, well, what if, what if God don't do it? What if, what if God doesn't do it? What if God doesn't come through like I need him? Because I have real bills. I have a real sick grandmother. I have a child that's really in jail. I have a circumstance over here that's very real that if it doesn't get done in a, a certain amount of time, then there's going to be some real consequences. And so I can feel as though God is just taking too long. I can feel as though God, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to figure this out another way because your way is just taking too long. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of the unknown. I'm afraid that 
Man, if this doesn't think, if this doesn't get taken care of tomorrow because the deadline is next week, if this doesn't get taken care of tomorrow, then I'm gonna feel as though you know the whole my whole world is falling apart. Sometimes we don't realize we make things bigger than what it is. Your fear will magnify things. Your fear will make things seem larger than what they are. When you're governed by fear, when you are allowing the lies of the enemy to come in, he'll capitalize on that thing. He'll capitalize on the situation and on the circumstance and he'll present it. He'll make it seem bigger than what it is that man, if you don't do this now, you know, you're going to lose your car. They're going to report your car. You know, you know, if you don't do this now, they're going to evict you. You know, if you don't, if you don't do this now, your child could be locked away for a very long time. You know, if you don't do this now, your grandmother could die. You know, if you don't do this now, you know, things could be bad for you. You know, he, he sows those lies in us, making us feel that, man, if we don't act now, you know, some things that they present out there in the world, they tell you, you know, you got to act now. You got to act now on this offer because this is a one in a lifetime offer. This offer is not going to come back around again until you see it six months later. The same offer that they told you you had to jump for to get, you know, you did just to find out later on that they were going to throw out that same offer. That's how the enemy works. He makes you feel as though you have to respond right now. Oh no, you got to make a decision now. You don't have time to think this over. You don't have time to wait on God. Matter of fact, God is not even going to come through for you. He'll tell you those lies. This is why it's important to stay near to God. This is why it's important that we have the kind of relationship with God where God can call us a friend and we can know that no matter what we are faced with, no matter what we are going through, we already know who God is. No, God is trustworthy. No, God came through for me the last time. And so I don't let my circumstances in my situation, tell me who my God is. I tell my circumstances and my situations. I tell the problem. I tell the opposition. I tell the adversity in my life who my God is. No, this is my God. He shall supply all of my needs. Oh no, God said that he will never leave me nor forsake me. God says that if if I wait on him, he'll renew my strength. Oh no, the word of God says that he make he makes all things work together for the good of them that love him and that are the call. Oh no, he says that he will comfort me. He will not leave me comfortless. That's when you begin to speak the word of God. You begin to remind yourself of the word of God. I wish King Saul would have reminded himself of the promises of God like King David did. That's why we have the book of Psalms where David is constantly talking to the Lord. And most of the time, King David is talking to himself. He's encouraging himself in the Lord. He's, con he's confiding in the Lord through what the Lord promised him. He's reminding himself of the promises and who God is. He's reminding himself. He lived that kind of life. When you live a life where your heart is after God's. When you live that life where, oh no, I'm I, I'm a person after God's heart. I have his heart. I know him. I know him so well. When you live that kind of life, then you you don't have to be positioned in a place where you are always making impulsive decisions. You live as one who knows how to be still. You live as one who knows how to wait on God. You live as one who's not governed by fear, but you live by faith. Oh no, I'm not moved by these circumstances. I already know that God is going to come through for me. I already know that God is going to answer that prayer because he's not left me now. He's not left me then. He's not left me now. And he's not going to leave me at all because that's what he said in his word, that he would never leave me nor forsake me. And so I don't have to be moved by the size of the giant because, you know, giants, they do fall. So I don't, I, I'm not governed at the size of this circumstance. The circumstance can seem so big, but you got to know that the God that you serve is bigger than the circumstance. He's bigger than the giant in front of you. He's bigger than that. He's bigger than the circumstance. He's bigger than what those that are threatening you are saying. He's bigger than them. Do you believe that? Yeah, they're saying that they're going to evict you. Yeah, they're saying that they're going to repull your car. Yeah, they're saying that they're going to take this from you and they're going to threaten you and you're going to be charged with this. Listen, I'm telling you, let me tell you something. God is bigger than the government. God is bigger than the government system. God is bigger than infirmities and different sicknesses and diseases. God is bigger than that. God is not moved or faced, if I can say that, by the things here in, in this life that we are governed by. No, those things don't 
intimidate God. God is big. And because he's so big, nothing is too big for him. Nothing is too much for him. He can handle he can handle anything. I've, I've, I've heard of all kinds of testimonies. All kinds of testimonies. And so we need to be the kind of people who trust God more than we trust Google or Siri. We need to be the kind of people who can wait on God even when everything around us is moving so fast. We have to be those. And, you know, I'm talking to myself as well. Learning to be patient and to wait on God. Fighting my flesh, fighting my soul that already believes that God is not good. Oh, no, I got to remind myself, no, God is good. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Oh, no, God is good and his mercy endures forever. Oh, no. I... Fighting my sinful nature, I'm fighting my soul, that part of my soul that says, God is not going to come through for me. Oh no, the devil is a liar. We're going to wait on God because I've waited on him in the past and he came through for me. And so why can't he not come through for me now? Is he not still God? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's the only reason why I'm still standing anyways. God is the reason why I am still standing today. He got me through it back then. He did it for me then. He could do it for me now. And so I'm living a lifestyle of faith. This is why you got to live a lifestyle of faith. If you are living by faith, then there's no room for fear. There's no room for a plan B. There's no room for any other option. There's no room to move before God or to jump ahead of God because you're, you're, you're living by faith that tells you that if God is for me, who can be against me? If God is the one driving this vehicle, driving this plane, then I'm at a place where I'm at peace. I'm at a place where I already know that he's in control and that he knows what he's doing. No, God knows what he's doing. I don't have to take the wheel. I don't have to step in. I don't have to, you know, I forget how they call it, co-drive. Co-drive, I forget the, the terminology, but I don't have to be in the back seat still trying to direct him on where to go and turn here. No, 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 don't go. I don't have to do that because I believe God. I believe God and that's enough. That's enough. I believe God to where I don't, I don't have to go before him. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be afraid because perfect love, which he gives me, it casts out all fear. So I don't have to be governed by fear. I don't have to be governed by impatience. I don't have to be impatient. I don't have to feel as though it's taking too long. We really need to be a people that are coming outside of that because it's causing us to make decisions that's keeping us separate from God because we, we are too impatient. We feel as though things are taking too long. I'm telling you, it's the world that you're living in that, that will make you one who just, you don't like to wait on nothing. They tell you they're coming in a week and that's too long for you. I need my internet set up now. Okay, I got to go to work tomorrow. I need my internet set up now. Can y'all do something? We don't like to wait. And when we're told to wait, you know, that, that makes us angry because then we feel entitled. And we're that way. But God, I'm telling you, we, we, we need deliverance. We need deliverance from the spirit of impatience and fear, I'm telling you. We need deliverance because it really has caused, caused us to miss out on so many different things it it caused us to take on other things plan b's and c's that with those you know there are sufferings attached there is it's almost like side effects side effects yeah you can go the natural way or you can go the fast <clears throat> the fast way the fast way you know it's gonna it's gonna take care of the problem quick but there are some side effects. But, you know, with God, there is no side effects. There is no warning labels on, you know, having, you know, failed kidneys and failed livers. No, no. God's way is the best way. God's way is the perfect way. I have to trust that. I have to agree with that. I have to believe that. I have to believe. I have to believe. So wait on the Lord. The word of God promises that. In Isaiah, that those who wait on the Lord, he will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagle. They will run and not be weary. They're going to walk and not faint. He's promising that he's going to keep you up. He's going to uphold you in his right hand. He's going to keep you from falling. He's going to present you faultless. Yeah, he's going to strengthen you. He's going to give you eagle's wings. Yeah, he's going to teach you how to soar. He's going to teach you how to fly. As he takes you up higher, he's going to give you an aerial view. Yeah, he's going to promote you. He's going to elevate you. He's going to take you higher. 
Yeah, he's going to prepare you for altitude because you choose to wait on him. You choose to trust in him. Those are the promises of God, along with many other promises. We just have to be a people that gets outside. We come from outside of our comfort zone, our society of what we're used to and what we're prone to. And we step into faith. We place our lives in the hands of God. I got to live by faith every day. I don't know where it's going to come from. I don't know how it's going to be done, but what I do know is God. And listen, that's enough. That's all I know. That's listen, all I know is God. That's all I know. That's all I know. And so that's how I live. I don't live according to my own standards and my own knowledge. I live according to God's and I lean on his understanding. His understanding is, is better. Yeah. I'm not trusting in my own way and in my own knowledge. I trust in his because he's God. And he's in control and he knows all things. So that has to be my life. That has to be your life as a believer. And so I pray that you have the ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. And that you have a heart that is in position to receive what God is wanting for you to take in. So that you can be where you need to be in the Lord. And that he can be pleased at the end of your life. In Jesus' name, God bless you.